analyzing leaders, they find that they all have seven qualities in common. And these qualities are all learnable qualities. And they learn, you learn them by practice. Whatever you dwell upon, or think about, grows in your mentality. You think about these qualities, you to develop the qualities. Number one, the most important quality is the vision. Leaders have vision. Peter Drucker said that if you do not have a vision to be a world leader when you start your business on your kitchen table, you'll probably never be very successful. Imagine you could be a world leader. He asked the question, well, if I was the world leader in my field, how would I be different from today? How would my company be different from today? Cannot achieve. You cannot write it down. You don't know what it is. Clear, fuzzy. It's almost like you're driving claw night. And you write it down as there's a direct relationship between how clear your ideal future is on paper. You may not even know clearly where you're going to achieve it. All you have to do is clear about what you want. There's a difference between winners and losers in every field. Winners take the first step with no guarantee of success. Second quality is courage. Two qualities that every single leader had in common. Vision. Exciting picture of the future that they wanted to create. Courage. The courage to take action on the vision with no guarantees. Nothing worthwhile in life. Possible. In a risk. The risk is that it won't work. Move out of the comfort zone. The biggest single limitation on success in work today is the comfort zone. You will become comfortable doing things a certain way. There is a whole new field that I work in called business no, innovation. As a rapid change, our business, most business models are obsolete. The wonderful thing about business model innovation is that it's a skill. They're all learnable. As you can learn, you've got to get out of your company. Hardest thing for all companies, biggest single, well, set. People want to check. Comfortable doing it the old way. Child. Third quality of leadership worldwide is integrity. It's impossible to follow someone if you don't believe them. If you don't believe that they say is true. The biggest mistake that leaders can make is to make a promise and not keep the promise. They say that they will do something and then not do it. So, integrity is considered the most important skill. It even comes before leaders with vision, courage. So it's really important if you're a leader, you have a reputation. Everybody won't know who you are. And you will be fit. The number four is responsibility. Leaders do not criticize or complain. When you criticize anything or anyone, actually you weaken yourself. And when you become weak, you become little. In the military academies, whenever you are with a senior officer, and you have, let us say, you have your five. You. Dot iron. S.A. Cadet. Why is your jacket? An iron. And you're only allowed to give one of three answers. Yes, sir. No, sir. No excuse. That's how they train the top officers in the world. Because they know that the nothing makes a person weaker or littler. Always making excuses. No leader could be a leader. All they did was make excuses. Henry Ford once gave this motto for success. It's never complain, never explain. This is the fifth quality. Leaders is excellence. Leaders set high standards. Leaders uh, work for excellence in products and services. Is they're constantly striving. They did a study recently. Fastest growing small and medium sized companies in America. These companies in three years had grown 10, 20, 50, 100 times in size. Profit. They study, they say, what is the most important factor in the success of these businesses? All in very competitive fields. Tremendous. Number one was quality. The products and services they produced were recognized as being top quality. And leaders of those companies were intensely focused on improving quality. Every day they're looking for ways to improve the products and services in the way that they take care of their customers. And sometimes one small change makes a tremendous difference. So, number six is communication. Leaders are good communicators. Those who lead are the ones who can clearly talk about what they believe. Let's imagine that we're out on a, on a tour, a three-hour tour on the boat. 
and we get stranded on a desert island. Well, one of us stands up and says, I will leave. We want to follow the second guy. The only thing we have is his conviction, his absolute belief in the existence of that world that we cannot see. And his ability to put that future state into words that we're drawn to. And we will volunteer to go with him, maybe even take personal risk. The irony is our own survival depends on our ability to help each other. This is the irony. And here we go, we have to cross rivers and go around boulders and chop down trees. And eventually we come to where he said the fishing village is. And there's no fishing village. And he turns to us and says, I believe there was a fishing village. But that doesn't matter because look what we were able to do. We were able to get through that forest together. That's called leadership. When people believe what you believe, they will work for you with blood and sweat and tears. When they don't believe what you believe, they work for your money. The seventh quality of leadership is action. The action orientation is the critical thing. If a person takes action quickly on a new idea, chances are they're going to be successful bought by When you take action is you get three benefits. The first benefit is that you get feedback, which enables you to self-correct. And all of life is a process of experimenting. Second of all is you get ideas. It makes you smarter. It activates more uh, of your brain. Sitting there passively doesn't do anything. But taking action actually sort of lights up your brain like a Christmas tree. Uh, and the third area, third factor, is that taking action gives you confidence. The more confidence you have, the more creative you are, the more energy you have, the happier you are. You feel like you're in control of your life. You feel powerful. And that is why the difference, the top 20% of people in every society and business are proactive, constantly taking action. The bottom 80% are passive. Is they're waiting for someone else to come and tell them what to do. And so, since you are highly proactive, you're obviously in the top, of the top 10% of your field. And the people in the top 10% are the ones they call the progress. Maybe not in the short term, but in the long term. Is a person who acts like a leader is a leader that minute. The person can go from being a passive person, a follower, to being a leader in one instant. Uh, all you have to do is begin to act like a leader. Think like a leader and act like a leader. Number one, your personal leadership ability is the major limit on what you can achieve. Because what you do is you set a goal, and you make a plan, and you work on that goal every single day. That's your leadership. When a team is in trouble, they don't fire the players, they change the coach. When a company's in trouble, they don't fire the staff, they bring you a new leader. A new leader can, can transform an organization. Number two is leadership is the ability to get results. Do you get the results that are expected of you? Well, you get the results that you have committed to get. If you start your own business, the results you committed to get it are getting, making sales, generating profits to provide for yourself and your family and so on and so forth. So results are the key. So I call it like, like a semicolon or a colon. There's a one-to-one -one between leadership and results. You can be a leader without followers. You don't have to have any of your As long as you're getting results, you're a leader. Third is leaders have a clear vision of the future. Top 10% of people have a very clear idea of where they're going. They have clear goals and clear plans they're working on. Drucker said that leaders think about the future. A vision is an ideal future picture. Helps the company decide what they should be doing more of, what they should be doing less of, what is consistent with their philosophy and their values, and what is not. So it's very important that individuals and organizations sit down and think through what the vision should be. Decide what's right before you decide what's possible. Imagine that your company is now perfect in every respect. It has the finest people, products, processes, and services. What would it look like? What would it stand for? Allow yourself to play with this idea. It's just called blue sky thinking, and it's practiced by all peak performing executives. They allow themselves to dream and to visualize what the very ideal would be. Leaders expect to fail over and over again. They don't like it. They don't want it. They avoid it if they possibly can, but they know it is an inevitable part of moving forward, but they're willing to take it. They're willing to take the pain okay? in pursuit of success. You'll find that successful people fail far more than unsuccessful people. Successful people hate the, hate the failure and they don't like the risk, but they take it anyway because that's... So therefore, when you, when you have a situation where you have to take a risk, do everything possible to mitigate your risk. Interesting discovery. Successful entrepreneurs are not risk seekers. They're very clever risk avoiders in pursuit of profit. They're not out there throwing their money around like gamblers in Las Vegas. They're very careful with their money. They know that in any case, a good friend of mine said two-thirds of your, of your investment. No matter how much due diligence you do will not work out. 
You just have to minimize your losses. The best information, maximize your profits. Don't ever be afraid of taking out, taking, taking a risk in the pursuit. Number two is to market and innovate. Always looking for faster, better, newer, more original, different, cheaper ways to get the job done more effectively for yourself and your organization. Encouraging people to be creative means encouraging them to come up with ideas and never raining on their parade. The Japanese employees of large corporations generate a hundred times the number of ideas that employees of American corporations generate. And you know the reason? The reason is because every single idea is respected and every single idea is encouraged and every single person with an idea gets an opportunity to try it out on a small scale. In American corporations, however, when somebody comes up with an idea, everybody takes turn dumping on the idea and pointing out all the holes in the ideas. So welcome ideas and encourage creativity. Allow people to come up with even ridiculous ideas and just listen to them. Three, set priorities and work on key tasks. There's always a hundred things that you can do, but the ability to set priorities is one of the most important of all skills that we have as an adult. Number four is focus and concentrate where superior results are possible. And this is important. Ben Trigo had the very worst use of time is to do very well what need not be done at all. It's amazing how many of us spend an enormous amount of time working on something that need not be done at all. It's the rule for great success. Yes, do fewer things, but do more important things and do more of them and get better at them. Do fewer things, but do more important things, and do them more often, get better at them. And that alone will double your income. Number five is solve problems and make decisions. Your ability to solve problems is usually the critical factor in your promotion, income, your success, so on. Colin Powell um, said that leadership is the ability to solve problems. Between you and any goal you have, as your financial goal, the only thing that stands between you is problems. Your ability to remove the obstacles that hold you back from achieving your financial goals is the critical skill of all. Thinking, that then, de defining the problems clearly, by defining the solutions clearly, picking the most important solution to the most important problem and taking action on it, and, working on it and expecting it not to work a few times until you finally wake it through. Number six, lead by example. Be a role model. Once you take the roles, everybody is watching you. And your job is to be a role model. Can't sit, live your life as though your every act were to become a universal law. As a leader, if you set high standards for yourself, you will be, by extension, setting high standards for others. Remember, everybody watches you. You're the standard bearer. You know, if you have children, what they found in psychology is that children are more influenced by your example than by anything else that you do or say. Well, and anything else that you say. Number seven is perform and get results. What can you and only you do that if done well can make a real difference? Sometimes it's a decision you need to make or a customer you need to call or a sales plan you need to initiate. But there's always something that you and only you can do. If you don't do it, nobody else will do it. But if you do do it and you do it well, it can make a real difference. And whatever you're doing, if it's not the most valuable, you stop doing it and start doing what is. This takes tremendous discipline, but as Goethe said, everything is hard before it's easy. Good habits are hard to form, and the most important of all habit to fo habits to form is the habit of working on the most valuable thing you can possibly do. Leadership and self-discipline go hand in hand. It is not possible to imagine an effective leader who lacks self-discipline, willpower, self-control, and self-mastery. The overarching characteristic of a leader is that he is in complete control of himself and every situation. There's seldom been a time in history when leaders were so needed and so much in demand as today. We need leaders at every level of society, both in the profit and non-profit sectors. We need leaders in our families, businesses, places of worship, community organizations, and especially politics. We need men and women who take their responsibilities seriously and are willing to step forward to take command of the situation. Fortunately, leadership is learnable. Leaders are developed, usually self-developed, over time through hard work, experience, and training. As Peter Drucker once said, there may be natural born leaders, but there are so few of them that they make no difference in the great scheme of things. Four Stages of Development in your career in business, you progress through four levels of activity and attainment. 
First, you start off as an employee with limited knowledge and experience. Then, as you grow, learn, and develop the ability to get results, you evolve upward and become a supervisor with responsibility for the performance and results of other people. As you continue to move up the scale of supervision, improving your ability to get things done through others from directly overseeing the work of employees, you become a manager, someone who assigns work to people with demonstrated competence in certain areas. Managers have a larger view, and this comes with greater responsibilities. As you move up the scale of management, becoming more knowledgeable and effective in getting more and better results from more and different people, you reach the highest level, that of a leader. At this stage, you are responsible for determining what is to be done rather than how it is to be done. It is said that some leaders are made, some are born, and some people have leadership thrust upon them. Leaders emerge or are promoted to deal with a situation requiring leadership ability. In its simplest terms, the role of the leader is to take responsibility for results. The primary reason that people are promoted into increasingly higher levels of leadership is because they demonstrate the ability to get the required results at each level. The ongoing question of the leader is always, what results are expected of me? Clarity is essential. The main reason that some people are not promoted into greater leadership positions, or perhaps they are even fired, is because of failure to execute. They do not do the most important jobs expected of them, nor do they get the results demanded of them. Leaders have vision. The first quality of leadership based on 3,300 studies of leaders reviewed by James McPherson is the quality of vision. Leaders have vision. They have the ability to project forward into the future and develop a clear picture of where they want their organizations to go. They then have the ability to share this vision with others and gain others' commitment to make this vision a reality. You become a leader when you accept responsibility for results. You become a leader when you begin to think, act, and talk like a leader. You become a leader when you develop a vision for yourself and for your company, your life, or your area of responsibility. There are hundreds of books written about leadership and the importance of vision, yet they can be boiled down to a single principle. A military leader has a vision of victory from which he never deviates. A business leader has a vision of success for the business based on excellent performance to which he or she is completely committed. A leader is a standard bearer. The leader sets the standard for the organization or the department. It is not possible for anyone in the organization to have a clearer vision or to aspire to a higher standard of excellence than the leader. For this reason, the leader is the role model, the one who sets the tone and the morale for everyone in the organization. The personality and influence of the leader affects everyone below him in the company, organization, or department. You cannot raise morale in a business. It filters down from the top from the leader. The behavior of the leader influences and affects the behavior of everyone else. If the leader is positive, confident, and upbeat, everyone in the organization will be influenced by his behavior and will be more confident, positive, and upbeat as well. Walk the talk. When you become a leader, you must discipline yourself to be leader-like. You must walk, talk, and act the part of a leader. You become a different person with different responsibilities than the manager. When you are working your way up, you are a part of the staff or the sales team. When you become a manager, you are part of management. This means that when you are part of the staff, your orientation is upward and sideways. But when you become a leader, your orientation is downward toward all the people for whom you are responsible. Perhaps the most important behavior of a leader is for you to discipline yourself to be your role model. Imagine that everyone is watching you and patterning everything they do and say based on your behavior. When you become a leader, you no longer have the luxury to let it all hang out. From the time you are promoted into leadership, you have a special responsibility to discipline and control your words and behaviors in such a way so that you bring about the very best possible results for your organization and for other people. Set the standards. The leader sets the standards for the organization's behavior, quality of work, personal organization, time management, and appearance. 
In excellent organizations, the leader is the person who everyone looks up to and wants to emulate. In most cases, the leader works harder than others in the company. The leader appears to be more committed, more determined, more courageous, more visionary, and more persistent than anyone else. The leader sets a tone that everyone wants to emulate. The leader also sets the standard for how people are treated in the organization. When the leader treats people with courtesy, consideration, and concern, it quickly becomes known that these are the standards to which others must adhere. Set the values and principles. In addition to a clear vision for the organization, the leader must have a set of values and organizing principles that guide behavior and decision making. Everyone must know what the leader and the company stands for and believes in. The job of a leader then is to articulate this vision of excellent performance within the constraints of high ethical standards at all times. He or she must walk the talk and live the values and behaviors he or she teaches. The very best standard for a leader is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For example, when Jack Welch was the president of General Electric, he encouraged managers to treat each employee as if that employee might be promoted over his head sometime in the future, and he might find himself working under the person who is now working below him. This way of thinking assured that managers treated their staff with a high degree of respect and courtesy. 7. Principles of Leadership To be an effective leader, there are seven principles you must incorporate into your leadership behavior and activities. 1. Clarity This is perhaps your most important responsibility. You must be absolutely clear about who you are and what you stand for. You must be absolutely clear about your vision and where you want to lead your people. You must be absolutely clear about the goals and objectives of the organization and how they are to be achieved. Especially, you must be absolutely clear about the values, mission, and purpose of the organization and what it stands for. Everyone around you and below you must know exactly why they are doing what they do and what their company has been formed to accomplish. 2. Competence as the leader, you must set a standard of excellent performance for the organization, as well as for every person and function in the company. Your goal must be for your company to be as good or better than your very best competitor. You must be continually seeking ways to improve the quality of your product and services to your customers. 3. Commitment The leader is absolutely committed to the success of the organization and believes completely that this organization is the best in the business or will be the best in the future. This passionate commitment to the organization and to success and achievement motivates and inspires people to do their best work and put their whole hearts into their jobs. 4. Constraints The job of the leader is to identify the constraints or limiting factors that set the speed at which the company achieves its most important goals of revenue and profitability. The leader then allocates people and resources to alleviate those constraints and remove the obstacles so it can perform as one of the best in the business. 5. Creativity The leader is open to new ideas of all kinds and from all sources. The leader is continually encouraging people to find faster, better, cheaper, and easier ways to produce excellent products and services and to take better care of customers. Number five, continuous learning. The leader is personally committed to reading, listening, and upgrading his or her personal knowledge and skills as an executive. The leader should attend additional seminars and courses to improve his or her skills and abilities. At the same time, the leader encourages everyone in the organization to learn and grow as a normal and natural part of business life. The leader provides time and resources for training and development. The leader knows that the best companies have the best trained people, the second best companies have the second best trained people, and the third best companies have the least trained people and are on their way out of business. Number seven is consistency. The leader has the self-discipline to be consistent, dependable, reliable, calm, and predictable in all situations. One of the great comforts of business life is for an employee to know that the leader is completely consistent and reliable. An effective leader does not change from day to day, 
The leader is not blown in the wind by each new situation or problem or emergency that arises. Instead, the leader is calm, positive and confident, especially under pressure. The Inevitable Crisis The only thing that is inevitable in the life of the leader is the crisis. When you rise to a position of leadership, you will experience crises repeatedly. Crises that are unpredictable, unbidden, and often capable of seriously damaging the organization. It is in the crisis that the leader demonstrates his competence. In times of crisis, the leader becomes calm, cool, objective, and completely in control. The leader asks questions and gathers information. The leader assesses the situation accurately and makes whatever decisions are necessary to minimize the damage or cut the losses. Great leaders discipline themselves to keep their fears and misgivings private. They do not share their concerns with their staff, knowing that this can cause confusion and loss of morale. Instead, the leader asks a lot of questions, probes deeply into situations so that he or she understands them thoroughly, and keeps his or her feelings private. As far as the members of the organization are concerned, the leader is always calm, positive, relaxed, and in complete control, no matter what is happening. Self-control and leadership there's a direct relationship between your ability to discipline yourself and your behaviors and your readiness to lead. It is only when you prove to others that you are in complete control of yourself that they develop the confidence to put you in a leadership position and keep you there. The leader realizes that everything he says to or about another person is magnified. The leader therefore praises and encourages people, both in their presence and when they are not around. He never says anything negative that could be misinterpreted or that could demotivate or offend another person. If he has problems with someone, he addresses them privately, out of sight and earshot of anyone else. Leadership Qualities Leaders discipline themselves to plan, prepare, organize and check every detail. They take nothing for granted. They ask questions to ensure that they have a complete understanding of a situation, problem, or difficulty. Great leaders act as if they own the entire company. They accept a high level of personal responsibility. The leader never complains, makes excuses, or blames others for problems. Leaders are intensely action-oriented. They gather information carefully and they make the decisions that are necessary. They set measures and standards and hold others to them. They insist that the job be done quickly and well. Leaders rise to the top. Leaders rise to the top of an organization as cream rises in milk. When you accept complete responsibility for getting results, concentrate single-mindedly on completing your most important tasks, continually upgrade your knowledge and skills as well as your ability to contribute value to your company, and treat other people with kindness and consideration, you will emerge as a natural leader. As you demonstrate your ability to make an increasingly valuable contribution to your organization, people above, below, and on both sides of you will want you to be promoted into leadership and will support you when you reach that position. One of your primary aims in life is to walk, talk, act, speak, and treat others as a leader would. Eventually, your position will be equal to your performance. Your conscious mind is the head office of your life. Its role is to deal with the information in your environment and then to identify, analyze, compare it against other information, and then to decide what actions to take. But it is your subconscious mind that contains the great powers that can enable you to accomplish vastly more than you ever have before. At least 90% or more of your mental powers are below the surface. It is essential that you learn to tap into these powers to motivate, stimulate, and drive you forward toward the achievement of your goals. Your subconscious mind functions best with clear goals, specific tasks, deliberate measures, and firm deadlines. The more of these with which you program your subconscious computer, the better it functions for you, and the more you will accomplish in a shorter period of time. As you set your goals and begin moving toward them, 
It is essential that you establish a series of benchmarks or measures that you can use to evaluate your progress day by day and hour by hour. The more clear and specific the measures you set, the more accurate you will be in hitting your targets on schedule. Your subconscious mind requires a forcing system composed of deadlines that you have imposed on yourself for task accomplishment and goal attainment. Without a forcing system, it becomes easy for you to procrastinate and delay and to put off important tasks until much later. If at all, there are three keys to peak performance in achieving your goals. They are commitment, completion, and closure. When you make a firm commitment to achieve a particular goal and you put aside all excuses, it is very much like stepping on the accelerator of your subconscious mind. You will be more creative, determined, and focused than ever before. Great men and women are those who make clear, unequivocal commitments and then refuse to budge from them no matter what happens. Completion is the second ingredient in peak performance. There is an enormous difference between doing 95% of a task and doing 100% of a task. In fact, it is very common for people to work very hard up to the 90% or 95% level and then to slack off and delay the final completion of the task. This is a temptation that you must fight against. You must continually force yourself, discipline yourself to resist this natural tendency and push through to completion. Every time you complete a task of any kind, your brain releases a small quantity of endorphins. This natural morphine gives you a sense of well-being and elation. It makes you feel happy and peaceful. It stimulates your creativity and improves your personality. It is nature's wonder drug. The more important the task that you complete, the greater is the quantity of endorphins that your brain releases is very much like a reward for success and achievement. Over time, you can develop a positive addiction to the feelings of well-being that you receive from this endorphin rush. Even when you complete a small task, you feel happier. When you complete a large task, you feel happier still. When you finish the various steps on the way to the completion of a large task at every achievement, you get an endorphin rush. You feel continuously happy and exhilarated when you are working steadily toward the completion of an important job. Everyone wants to feel like a winner and feeling like a winner requires that you win. You get the feeling of the winner by completing a task 100%. When you do this repeatedly, eventually, you develop the habit of completing the tasks that you begin. When this habit of task completion locks in, your life will begin to improve in ways that you cannot today imagine. In psychology, the reverse is always true. The incomplete action is a major source of stress and anxiety. In fact, much of the unhappiness that people experience is because they have not been able to discipline themselves to follow through and complete an important task or responsibility. If you have ever had a major assignment that you have been putting off, you know what I'm referring to. The longer you wait to get started on an assignment and the closer the deadline approaches, the greater stress you experience. It can start to keep you up at night and affect your personality. But when you finally launch into a task and push it through to completion, you feel a great sense of relief and well-being. It is almost as if nature rewards you for everything that you do that is positive and life-enhancing. At the same time, nature penalizes you with stress and dissatisfaction when you fail to do the things that move you toward the goals and results that are important to you. One of the most popular movements in modern management is toward the balanced scorecard. Using these scorecards, every person at every level of the business is encouraged to identify the key measures that indicate success and then to give themselves scores every day and every week in each of those key areas. Here is an important point. The very act of identifying a number or score and then paying close attention to it will cause you to improve your performance in that area. For example, if someone were to tell you before a meeting that you were going to be evaluated on how well you listen in that meeting, your listening skills would improve dramatically. Within a few moments, you would listen far more carefully and attentively throughout the meeting because you knew that this behavior was being observed in the same way. Whenever you select a goal, measure, or activity that is important to you and begin observing or paying attention to it, 
in your day-to-day -day life, your performance in that area improves. One of the most helpful actions you can take in your own career is to set benchmarks and create scorecards, measures, metrics, and deadlines for every key task that you must complete on the way to one of your goals. In this way, you activate your subconscious forcing system. This forcing system will then motivate you and drive you at an unconscious level to start earlier, work harder, stay later, and get the job done. The third CI after commitment and completion is closure. This is the difference between an open loop and a closed loop. Bringing closure to an issue in your personal or business life is absolutely essential for you to feel happy and in control of your situation. Lack of closure, unfinished business, and incomplete action of any kind are all major sources of stress, dissatisfaction, and even failure in business. They consume enormous amounts of physical and emotional energy. Perhaps the most important ability in the world of work is dependability. There is nothing that will get you paid more and promoted faster than to develop a reputation for getting your tasks done quickly and well and on schedule. Whatever your goals, make a list of all the tasks that you will have to accomplish in the achievement of those goals. Put a deadline on every one of those tasks, then work every day and every hour to hit your deadlines. Measure your progress each day as you go along, speed up or slow down where necessary. But remember you can't hit a target that you can't see. The greater clarity that you have with regard to deadlines and measures, the more you will accomplish and the faster you will get it done. A goal or a decision without a deadline is merely a discussion. It has no energy behind it. It is like a bullet with no powder in the cartridge. Unless you establish deadlines to which you are committed, you will end up firing blanks in life and work. Sometimes people ask, what if I set a deadline and I don't achieve the goal by the deadline? Simple, set another deadline, and then another, if necessary. Deadlines are best. Guess estimates of when the task will be completed. The more you set and work toward deadlines, the more accurate you will become in predicting the time necessary to complete them. You will become better and better at achieving your goals and completing your tasks on schedule. Every time you have heard the question, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer is, one bite at a time, this metaphor applies to achieving any big goal as well. How do you achieve a huge goal? You accomplish it one step, one task, one measure at a time. Break your long-term goals down into annual, monthly, weekly, and even hourly goals. Even if your long-term goal is financial independence, look for a way to break that down into how you're going to use each hour of the coming day in such a way that long-term financial independence is far more likely. If you want to increase your income, you know that all income is a result of added value. Look at everything you do, then then ask yourself how you could add more value so that you can be worth more than you are earning today. Go and ask your boss, what one thing do I do that is more valuable than anything else? Whatever his or her answer, look for ways to perform more and more of that task and to get better and better at doing it. It is absolutely amazing how much you can accomplish if you break your tasks down into bite-sized pieces, set deadlines, and then do one thing at a time. Every single day, you have heard the old saying, by the yard, it's hard but inch by inch, anything's a cinch. If you want to increase your hourly rate and your income, look for ways to get a little bit better at the most important things you do every single day. Read one hour per day in your field. Listen to audio programs on your way to and from work. Take additional courses whenever you can. These activities will propel your entire career onto the fast track. When you invest an extra one or two hours per day in self-improvement, the cumulative effect on your greater ability to get results can be extraordinary. If you want to lose weight, there is a simple five-word formula. Eat less and exercise more. If you discipline yourself to eat a little bit less but eat higher quality foods and simultaneously exercise a little bit more each day, you can get into the rhythm of losing one ounce per day. No matter how much you weigh today, if you lose one ounce each day, that will equal about two pounds per month. Two pounds per month will be 24 pounds per year. In no time at all, you can retrain your body and your appetite so that you lose the weight and keep it off for the rest of your life. If you want to become wealthy, begin to question every single expense. 
Set a goal to save $3, $5, or $10 per day. Put this money away in a savings account and never touch it. As it grows, invest it carefully in well-chosen mutual funds or index funds. Make daily, weekly, and monthly saving and investment into a habit and keep it up for the rest of your working life. In no time at all, you will become comfortable living on slightly less than you are spending today. As your income increases, increase the amount that you save in a few weeks, a few months, a few years, you will be out of debt and have a large amount of money put away and working for you. A few years down the road, you will be financially independent. If you read 15 minutes each evening rather than watching television, you will complete about 15 books per year. If you read in the great classics of English literature for 15 minutes each day in seven years, you will have read the 100 greatest books ever written. You will be one of the best, educated and most erudite people of your generation, and you can achieve this just by reading 15 minutes each evening before you go to bed. If you are in sales and you want to increase your income, keep careful track of how many calls, how many presentations, how many proposals, and how many sales you are making each day, each week, and each month at the present time. Then, set a goal to increase your number of calls, presentations, and proposals per day. Set a goal to increase your number of sales each week and each month. Every day, measure yourself against your own standards in each area of your life. Analyze your activities carefully and select a specific number that more than anything else determines your level of success in that area. Then, focus all of your attention all day long on that specific number. The very act of focused attention will cause you to perform better in that area both consciously and unconsciously. If you want to be healthier, you could focus on the number of minutes per week that you exercise or the number of calories per day that you eat. If you want to be successful financially, you can focus on the amount you earn each hour or the amount that you save each month. If you want to be successful in sales, you could focus on the number of calls you make each day, the number of sales or the size of sales you make each month. If you want to be successful in your relationships, you can focus on the number of minutes that you spend face to face with the most important people in your life each day and each week. You've heard the saying, what gets measured gets done. There's another saying, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Your ability to set specific measures on your goals and then to keep an accurate record and track your performance each day will assure that you achieve your goals exactly when you have decided to or even before. One of the words that destroys everything is called neglect. Neglect, and I found this out. A week of neglect could cost you a year of repair. Here's the list of attitude diseases. Number one is indifference. The shrug of the shoulder, the guy's not even concerned. He's just drifting. Well, to be any kind of winner, you've got to get worked up. There's one problem with drift. You cannot drift to the top of the mountain. A life full of adventure is a life full of many decisions. The ones that turn out to be wrong give you better experience to make better decisions. So don't see how many decisions you can get out of. See how many decisions you can get out of. See how many you can get into. That's where the adventure is. So shake off this disease, indecision. The next one is doubt, and one of the worst is self-doubt. The guy doubts himself, doubts if it'll last that long for him, doubts if he can do that well, Doubts if he can make that much. Doubts if he can make that much. Doubts if he can accomplish all that. So here's the key. Turn this coin over and become a believer. And there are many things to leave in. One of the majors is yourself. Now for those three, don't get you. This one will. Worry. That's a devastating disease. Worry causes health problems, social problems, personal problems, family problems. I used to have it bad. I used to be known as a super warrior. Not a super warrior. Not a super warrior. No, a uh, super warrior. My advice to you is, do what I finally did on worry. Give it up. I'm not saying it's easy. It took me almost one year to kick the worry habit, and it was not an easy year. 
I learned how to do it. And you can, here's the next attitude disease, over caution. Now you can also be too reckless, but you can also be too cautious. And my caution was always the risk. Risk used to drive me right up the wall. Then I'll tell you what changed my whole life. When I finally discovered it's all risky. The minute you were born, it got risky. The Englishman says, well, if that's the way it's going to work out, let's give it a go. Right, that's what it's for. Give it a go. Somebody says, yeah, but I'm looking for safety and security. Fine, then huddle in a corner, we'll cover you with a sheet, bring you three meals a day, and we'll protect you. Feed you, look after you, care for you, care for you, care for you. The guy said, yeah, I'd live to be 100. But what a way to live, right? What a way to live, safe and secure. And see, it's not important how long you live. What's important is how you live. Here's the next attitude disease. We're almost through this monthly list. The poor pessimist leads an ugly life. He doesn't try to figure out what's right. He tries to figure out what's wrong. He doesn't look for virtue. He looks for faults. To the pessimist, the glass is always half empty. To the optimist, the glass is half full. Quiet with the same measure affects people two different ways. I answered, it all depends on how you look at it. Our lives are mostly affected by the way we think things are, not the way they are. The way we think they are affects us the most. Kids ask good questions these days. One of them said to me, Mr. Bowen, how do you build a good life? I said, it's simple, but it's not easy. Here's how you build anything. Select the right ingredients. Keep out the wrong ingredients. And it starts with thought. I asked the kids, what would happen if somebody dropped sugar in my coffee? They said, well, you'd be okay. I said, what if somebody dropped strike nine in my coffee? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct, lesson one. Life is both sugar and strike nine. You've got to be careful. I said, what if my worst enemy drops in the sugar? They said, well, you'd be okay. I said, what if my best friend, even by accident, drops in the strike nine? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct lesson two. What's your coffee? You've got to be careful. See, it doesn't matter whose hands you get the bad stuff from. It doesn't matter where you get the bad stuff. It will still do its damage. On your bank account, wherever you get it. Complaining, crying, griping. Why do some people do so well in life while so many others don't? It's a deadly disease. It's how we feel about life that will decide how life feels about life feels about us. If we think we're going to fail, we might not even thrive. We are more likely to succeed in life if we have a positive I can do it attitude than if we have a negative I can attitude. So attitude is the magic word that can change our lives. It's up to us to have a good attitude about life and all the problems it brings. Before we talk about our attitude toward the world, it's important to discuss our attitude toward ourselves. We tend to minimize our own abilities and the goals we can achieve. We also tend to believe that others can accomplish things in our field that we cannot. As a result of this defensive, doubtful attitude toward ourselves, many people live narrow, darkened, and frustrated lives. However, those who stay young all their lives not only welcome change, but see it for what it really is. A new opportunity, a chance for further fulfillment. Attitude is a reflection of a person's will, and it's incalculably powerful. It can bring about marvelous results for us, but we need to train it patiently day by day. Successful people who constitute the top 5% of individuals who go from one success to another, successful people have a particular kind of attitude towards themselves and life that sets them apart from the rest. They possess a strong belief in their ability to accomplish what they set out to do, and they approach life with a healthy and positive attitude. Successful people possess an attitude towards themselves that is characterized by healthy self-esteem, confidence, and a positive outlook. They also have a healthy attitude towards failure, seeing it as an opportunity to learn and improve rather than a setback. One of the remarkable things about successful people is that they come to be called successful, outstanding, brilliant, lucky, and a host of other accolades. Even though they are not necessarily more intelligent or outstanding than the people around them, they're unwavering in their ability to succeed. Healthy self-esteem and a positive outlook set them apart from the rest. 
They see failure as an opportunity to learn and grow and obstacles as opportunities to overcome. By developing the right attitude towards themselves and life, anyone can achieve success and live their best life. The importance of attitude cannot be overstated. People who are successful regardless of their field or background all have one thing in common. The right attitude. They expect more good out of life than bad and they expect to succeed more than they fail. This mindset makes them resilient to failures and setbacks. The world we live in is impersonal and does not care whether we change or not. However, adopting a good, healthy attitude towards life can make a huge difference in our lives. By adopting a successful attitude, we can achieve our goals and lead a fulfilling life. It doesn't matter how good your attitude has been in the past. There's always room for improvement. Small refinements upon something already good can make it great. So here's the test. For the next 30 days, act towards the world. Everything and everyone with whom you come in contact with the attitude that represents the kind of results you want to achieve. For instance, if you want to be more successful in what you're doing, act as though you are already in possession of the success you see. If you want others to treat you with admiration and respect, treat others with admiration and respect first. You may not have realized it, but every person you interact with also believes that they are the most important person in the world. This is true for every human being on earth. So, for the next 30 days, try treating every person you come across as if they are the most important person in the world. Treating everyone in this way is important not only because it is the right way to treat others, but also because it can help you form a habit that will bring you amazing and delightful results for the rest of your life. When you treat others with respect and kindness, you are likely to receive the same treatment in return. This can lead to better relationships, improved communication, and ultimately more happiness and success in your personal and professional life. Success is not just about personal achievement, but also about the relationships and connections they make along the way. When you have a positive attitude, people are naturally drawn to you. So for the next 30 days, Make a conscious effort to treat others with the same kindness and respect that you want to be treated with. The key here is to approach each interaction with a positive mindset. Instead of focusing on what you can get out of the interaction, focus on what you can give. Remember, a good attitude is not something you have to be born with. It's something that can be developed through conscious effort and practice. You would recognize that when a person consistently acts with a positive and productive attitude, they have already placed themselves on the path to success. You would know that this kind of attitude places a person in the top 5% of individuals in any country. Similarly, before building a structure, the excavation and foundation must be laid. In order to achieve the kind of life a person wants, they must become the kind of individual they wish to be. They must think, act, talk, walk, and conduct themselves in all their affairs as the person they wish to become. Once a person becomes that individual, the things that person would have and do will naturally come to them almost immediately. Irritations that used to frustrate and annoy will disappear. When someone gives them a hard time, they will stay on track and not let the negative behavior affect them. By acting with a positive attitude, a person separates themselves from this negative group and begins to attract positive experiences and people into their lives. It's a universal truth that every human being has a deep-seated desire to feel valued and important. This need is not restricted to any particular gender or age group, but rather it is a fundamental need that every individual has from the time we are born. We crave attention and affection from those around us, and this need only intensifies as we grow older. On the other hand, when someone treats you with respect and kindness, acknowledges your efforts, and makes you feel important, it feels great, doesn't it? This is a feeling that we all crave and seek in our personal and professional relationships. Can you guess what's the most important quality to predict success and happiness in life? It's optimism. What they found was that successful people had really high levels of optimism. They were really optimistic. They were positive most of the time. Does that mean they didn't have problems? Oh, they had far more problems than the average person because they tried more things. They found that optimists had two great qualities which led to their success. Number one was they tried more things because they had an unrealistic expectation that they would be successful. They just kind of believed they would be successful. Yeah, 
They believed that if they just kept on, they would be successful. So they tried more things. Now the second quality they had is they persisted more because they had an unrealistic expectation that if they just persisted more, they'd succeed. What optimists have is what I call orientations. And the first orientation that optimists had is future orientation. They think about where they're going most of the time. They think about the Pideling most of the time. They think about the possibilities of the future. And they idealize. There are four areas where optimists idealize. Number one is great health. We want to have great health. We want to have great health. We want to feel good about ourselves. We want to have high levels of energy. Number two is that optimists want to have loving relationships. They want to have happy relationships. They want to have happy families. They want to have happy friends. They want to have happy friends. They want to have work with people they like, work for bosses they like. Well, the third thing that we all want is we all want to do meaningful work. And we don't want to do it poorly. It's so important for us to do our work well. Because this is what we found is how much you like yourself. Your level of self-esteem determines your level of optimism. People with high self-esteem set big goals for themselves. The starting point of achieving or dreaming great dreams is to have a fantasy or an imaginary idea of your life as if it were perfect sometime in the future. If your life was perfect in five years, what would it look like? What would it look like? Well, here's my favorite word in success. My favorite word in success is the word clarity. What I say is, you can't hit a target that you can't see. So your job is to be absolutely clear. If you had the power to achieve anything, if you could wave a magic wand over your life and have three wishes, what three wishes would you want? Health, happiness, money, financial independence. If you could dream it, you can do it. If you can write it down, if you can write it down, if you can imagine it and write it down. Then the only question you ask is you say, how do we do it now? Who else has got what I want and who else one time didn't have it and now they have it? And what you do is you go and find out how they got there. You read their books, you ask them questions, you listen to their programs, and then you discipline yourself to do the same things they did until you get the same result. Number four is financial independence. Now. We all judge ourselves in life by how well we're doing on each of these four. And we could be doing well in three, but if we're low in four, that's what bothers us. Now, the second part, the second part, the second orientation that successful people have is goal orientation. Goal orientation means that they have very clear written goals that they work on every single day. Take a piece of paper like this. Write the word goals at the top and write down at least 10 goals you want to accomplish in the next 12 months. Now, here's the important point. Writing down these goals takes two to three minutes. In fact, it's actually about three if you write down ten things that you want to accomplish in the next 12 months. Now, all you have to do then is take this piece of paper, fold it up, put it away somewhere where you won't see it for a whole year. You'll be happy because not eight of your ten goals will have been accomplished in the most amazing ways. And you'll be sad because you will wish you had written more goals and bigger goals People come to me and they say, my whole life has changed in the last 30 days. All kinds of things have happened. They've changed jobs, they've changed relationships, they've gotten a new house, they bought a car, they've taken a trip, and these are all things they wrote down. If all you'll do from this day is write down 10 goals and instead of putting them away for a year, just review them on a regular basis. Writing a goal down actually programs it into your subconscious mind. So even if your conscious mind doesn't even remember the list, your subconscious mind's got it. I've spoken all over the world and given this exercise. I've never had anybody say it didn't work. The only things they say are was incredible. The results in their lives were explosive. They could not believe it. Now the third orientation is excellence orientation. In order to achieve something you have never achieved before, you have to be good at something you've never been good at before. You have to develop skills you've never had before. I learned that everybody in the top 10% started where in the bottom 10%. Everybody's at the top and doing well was once at the bottom and doing poorly. Everyone who is now at the front of the buffet line of life was once at the back of the line. Every expert in their field was once not in your field at all. And anything that anyone else has done, you can do as well. The only one who can stop you is you. 
by stopping. So therefore, you find that people who have no advantages at all, but have one thing, they just don't stop. They get to the top 10%, and you could be in the top 10%. This is what I learned, which changed my life when I was 24 years old. If you make a decision to get into the top 10% and you don't take it back, you will get there. There's nothing to stop you. The only reason people don't get into the top 10% is that they don't decide to. And if they decide to, they don't get started. And if they get started, they quit. So it's very important. But optimists say, hey, I can be in the top 10%. I can be. And they just never quit. And they just never quit. No, you're sure lucky. No. You won't. You make your own luck. You make your own luck by deciding where you're going and getting on the road. The only way we're going to get to the top 10% is by becoming very good at what we do. There are no shortcuts. We just have to get down and work it out. Just make any decision, be absolutely clear. And then you set your future, your ideal, set the goal to achieve the ideal, determine the skill that you'll need. Now here's the fourth orientation, and this is really important. It's called growth orientation. Growth orientation is the key to the future and the key to the future and the key to your success as well. I say there are three things. Number one is read on a regular basis. Reading is to the mind as exercise is to the body. If you don't read, it's like if you don't exercise your muscles, what happens to them? So the rule is to read 30 to 60 minutes a day, five days a week. If you do that, you'll read about a book a week. That'll translate into about 50 books a year. 50 books a year will make you one of the smartest and highest paid people in your field. You'll go past everybody else in the business. So read on a regular basis. Now the second is to attend all the seminars that you can. Always trade money for time or life. And if it costs you a little bit to go to a seminar, pay the money because you'll get it back 10, 20, 50, 100 times. They're saying, I don't think that this is a good person to invest in. This company has no future. This person has no future. The interesting thing is that the more you invest in yourself, the more you believe in yourself, the more you like yourself, the more you like yourself, the more determined you become, the more confident you become, and the better you get. You are your most valuable asset. Your life, your potential, and your possibilities are the most precious things you have. Thus, your great goal in life should be to fulfill that potential and become everything you are capable of becoming. Your ability to learn, grow, and fulfill your potential is unlimited. Today, people are graduating from high school and college in their 70s, learning new subjects and developing new capabilities. Your ability to learn and remember and continues throughout your life if you keep your brain alive, alert, and functioning at its best. Your most precious financial asset is your earning ability. Your ability to work is your primary source of cash throughout your life. You could lose your home, your car, your bank account, or everything you own, but as long as you have your earning ability, you can earn it all back and more in the months and years ahead. Your biggest investment most people don't realize this. They take their earning ability for granted. But it has taken you your entire life to develop your earning ability. Every bit of education, experience, and hard work that you have invested in learning your craft and developing your skills has gone into building this asset. Your earning ability is very much like a muscle. It can increase in strength and power year by year as the result of regular exercise. Likewise, the opposite is true too. If left alone or ignored, your earning ability, like your muscles, can become weaker or even decline because you have simply failed to upgrade it continually. In other words, your earning ability can be either an appreciating or a depreciating asset. An appreciating asset is something that grows in a value and cash flow every year as a result of continual investment and improvement. A depreciating asset, on the other hand, is something that loses value over time and finally reaches the point at which it is written off, being of little or no further value. The choice is yours as to whether your earning ability is increasing or decreasing month by month and year by year. See yourself as the president of your own personal services corporation. 
Imagine that you were going to take your company public on the stock market. Would you recommend your company as a growth stock, continually increasing its value and earning ability each year? Or would you describe your company as one that has leveled off in the marketplace, that is not really going anywhere in terms of increased value and income? Would you recommend stock in Hue Inc. as an excellent investment? Why or why not? What got you here won't get you any further. Some people are actually losing value each year, declining in earning ability because they are not continually upgrading their knowledge and skills. They don't realize that whatever knowledge and skill they have today is rapidly becoming obsolete. It's being replaced by new knowledge and skills that if you don't have them and someone else does, you will be in danger of being overtaken by your competition. Join the top 20%. In Chapter 1, I mentioned that the 80-20 rule applies to income. The top 20% of people in our society earn and control 80% of the assets. According to Forbes, Fortune, Business Weekend, Wall Street Journal, and the IRS, by many estimates, the top 1% of Americans control as much as 33% of the asset. The most interesting discovery of income inequality is that most millionaires Multimillionaires and billionaires in America are first generation. They started with little or nothing and earned all their money by themselves in one lifetime. In America, there's a high level of income mobility, which means that you are able to move from the lower levels of income to the upper levels. Almost everyone who is in the top 20% today started in the bottom 20%. From that point, they began to do something different with their time and their lives, and as a result, they put themselves squarely onto the upward escalator of financial success. No limits on your potential. The average income increase in America is about 3% a year, just about the same as the rate of inflation and cost of living increases. People whose income is increasing at 3% a year seldom get ahead. They have a jaw, which can also be thought of as an acronym for just over broke. But the fact is that no one is better than you and no one is smarter than you. If someone is doing better than you are today, it is simply proof that they have learned how the law of cause and effect applies to their work and they have begun doing the things that other successful people have also done. The application of the law of cause and effect to your personal life is learn and do. The achievement of personal excellence is a decision you make or that you fail to make. But in the absence of a commitment to excellence in your chosen field, you automatically default to average performance, or even mediocrity. No one becomes excellent accidentally or by just going to work each day. Excellent requires a definite decision and a lifelong commitment. The Keys to the 21st Century Knowledge and skill are the keys to the 21st century. Becoming the best person you can possibly be and moving to the top of your field requires the application and self-discipline throughout your life. Mental fitness is like physical fitness. If you want to achieve either, you must work at it all the time. You can never let up. You must be continually learning and growing every day, week and month, throughout your career and in other areas of your life, if you're going to join the top 20% and stay there. To earn more, you must learn more. Abraham Lincoln once wrote, the fact that some have become wealthy is proof that others may do it as well. What others have done, you can do as well if you learn how. Everyone who is at the top was once at the bottom. Many people who come from average or poor families with average incomes, or who grow up in average circumstances have gone on to become some of the most prominent people in their fields. And what hundreds of thousands and even millions of other people have done, you can do as well. The philosopher Bertrand Russell once wrote, The very best proof that something can be done is that someone else has already done it. Ordinary into Extraordinary Very often you see people who don't seem to be as intelligent or as talented as you are, who are nonetheless accomplishing remarkable things with their lives. There's nothing that will make you angrier than to see someone who seems to be dumber than you, who's doing better than you. How can this be? The answer is simple. At a certain point in their lives, they realized that the key to success was personal and professional growth. It was a dedication to lifelong learning that made them successful. 
The good news is that almost every important skill is learnable. Every business skill is learnable. Everyone who is proficient in any area of business was at one time completely ignorant in that area. Every sales skill is learnable. Every top salesperson was once a beginning salesperson and unable to make a call or close a sale. All money-making skills are learnable as well. Almost every wealthy person was once poor. You can learn anything you need to learn to achieve any goal you can set for yourself. Make a decision. The starting point if you're moving upward and onward toward becoming one of the most confident, most respected and highest paid people in your field is simple. Make a decision. It's said that every major change in your life comes about when your mind collides with a new idea. And then you make a decision to do something different. You make a decision to complete your education, upgrade your skills, or get into a good college. You make a decision to start a new business. You make a decision to take a particular job or start a particular career. You make a decision to invest your money in a particular way. And especially, you make a decision to be the best in your field. Many people say that they would like to be happy, healthy, thin, and rich. But, as discussed in Chapter 4, wishing and hoping is not enough. You have to make a firm, unequivocal decision that you are going to pay any price and go any distance in order to achieve the goals you have set for yourself. You have to make that decision and then burn your mental bridges behind you. From that moment on, you resolve to continue working on yourself and your craft until you reach the top 20% or beyond. Follow the leaders, not the followers. When you decide to be one of the best people in your field, look around you and identify the people who are already at the top. What characteristics do they have in common? How do they plan and organize their days? How do they dress? How do they walk, talk, and behave with other people? What books do they read? How do they spend their spare time? Who do they associate with? What courses have they taken? What audio programs do they listen to in their cars? These are just a few of the questions you should ask in order to find out what successful people are doing that you might also need to do. After all, you can't hit a target that you can't see. Your selection of the right role models can have an enormous impact on your future. Dr. David McClellan of Harvard and author of The Achieving Society concluded that your choice of a reference group can determine as much as 95% of your success and achievement in life. Your reference group is made up of the people who you feel are just like me. Your natural tendency is to adopt the attitudes, styles of dress, opinions and lifestyles of the people with whom you identify and associate most of the time. Fly with the Eagles Some years ago, one of my seminar participants told me his story. Bob Barton said he had started off in his 20s in a large company with about 32 salespeople in his branch. It was his first real job and he was starting at the bottom. Because he was new, he hung around with the other junior salespeople. As they say, birds of a feather flock together. After a month or two, Bob noticed that the top salespeople in the office also associated with each other. They did not spend time with the junior salespeople. They also spent their time differently. When Bob got into work in the morning, the top salespeople were already there, planning their days and working on the telephone and making appointments. Bob also noticed that the junior salespeople would come in later, drink coffee, read the newspaper, and make excuses for not making sales calls. Bob decided that he was going to pattern himself after the top salespeople in the office. He looked at the way they dressed and groomed, and he resolved to dress and groom the way they did. Each morning he would stand in front of his mirror and ask himself, do I look like one of the top salespeople in my office? If the answer was no, he would go back and change his clothes until he felt that he looked as good as the best people. He began to come into the office and organize his day before 8.30 a.m. so that he was ready to make calls as soon as his customers were available to see him. One day, Bob asked one of the top salespeople if he could recommend a book or audio program that would help him. It turns out that top people are always willing to help other people improve. When he got the recommendation, Bob immediately went out and got the book and sent away for the audio program. He read the book and visited the program and then reported back to the top salesman. The top salesman gave him some more advice on things to read and listen to, all of which Bob followed. 
Bob asked another salesperson how he planned his day. And that salesperson showed him his time management system. So Bob began to plan and organize his day the way the top salespeople did it. By using these top salespeople as his role models and emulating them whenever possible, Bob started to make more appointments, see more prospects, and make more sales. Within six months, he was one of the top salespeople in the office as well. By that time, the top salespeople had invited him for coffee and lunch, and he became one of them rather than one of the junior people. The next year, Bob went to the National Sales Conference, where he met a lot of the top people from around the country. He deliberately sought them out and asked for their advice. What books would they suggest? What audio programs would they recommend? What seminars had they attended? What strategies did they find that were the most effective in building their sales business? Bob did something that very few people do. When he received advice, he followed it. He immediately took action on the advice and then reported back to the people who had given it to him. Within four years, Bob became one of the top salespeople in the country. His friends and associates were the other top salespeople in his branch and in the other branches. His income had increased several times. He wore beautiful clothes, drove a new car, lived in a lovely home, and had a wonderful wife. And he said that it all came about as a result of asking top salespeople for their input and then following that input and applying it to his sales activities. But here's the kicker. Over and over, the top people, the ones who had been winning the sales awards year after year, told Bob the same thing. He was the first person who had ever come up to them and asked them for advice. No one else had ever sought them out and asked them why they were so successful. The answers have all been found. Here's a great discovery. All the answers have been found. All the routes to success have been discovered. Everything you need to learn to move to the top of your field has already been learned by hundreds and even thousands of other people. And if you ask them for advice, they will give it to you. Successful people will have their phone calls held, cancel other appointments, and put their work aside to help other people to be successful. But you must ask, and then you must follow their advice once they give it to you. If you can't ask them directly, read their books and attend their talks and seminars. Listen to audio programs created by successful people. Sometimes you can send them emails and ask for advice. Learn from the best. Set high income as a goal. If your goal is to be in the top 20% of money makers in your field, the first thing you need to do is to find out what the people in the top 20% are earning today. This information is available. Just ask around. Check industry statistics. Go on to Google. You can find this information if you look for it. Once you know the income target at which you are aiming, write it down as your goal. Make a plan to achieve this level of income and work on it every day. Never stop until you reach it. The secret to high income in business and sales is quite simple. Learn and do. By jacking up a car, you improve one notch at a time. Each time you learn and practice a new skill, you ratchet up your earning ability, and it locks in. As long as you keep increasing your earning ability, you keep ratcheting up to a higher level, from which you seldom decline. Use the 3% formula to invest in yourself. To guarantee your lifelong success, make a decision today to invest 3% of your income back into yourself. This seems to be the magic number for lifelong learning. According to the American Society for Training and Development, this is the percentage that the most profitable 20% of companies in every industry invest in the training and development of their staff. Decide today to invest 3% of your income into yourself in order to make yourself an appreciating asset to continually increase your earning ability. If your annual income goal is $50,000, resolve to invest 3% of that amount or $1,500 back into yourself each year to maintain and upgrade your knowledge and skills. If your income goal is $100,000, resolve to invest $3,000 per year back into yourself to assure that you reach that level of income. The payoff is extraordinary. I was giving a seminar in Detroit a couple of years ago when a young man about 30 years old came up to me at the break. He told me that he had first come to my seminar and heard my 3% rule about 10 years ago. At that time, he had dropped out of college, was living at home, driving an old car, 
and earning about $20,000 a year as an office to office salesman. He decided after the seminar that he was going to apply the 3% rule to himself, and he did so immediately. He calculated 3% of his income of $20,000 would be $600. He began to buy sales books and read them every day. He invested in two audio learning programs on sales and time management. He took one sales seminar. He invested the entire $600 in himself in learning to become better. That year, his income went from $20,000 to $30,000, an increase of 50%. He said he could trace the increase with great accuracy to the things he had learned and apply from the books he had read and the audio programs he had listened to. So the following year, he invested 3% of $30,000, a total of $900 back into himself. That year, his income jumped from $30,000 to $50,000. He began to think, if my income goes up at 50% per year, by investing 3% back into myself, what would happen if I invested 5%? The next year, he invested 5% of his income, $2,500 into his learning program. He took more seminars, traveled cross country to a conference, bought more audio and video learning programs, and even hired a part-time coach. And that year, his income doubled to $100,000. After that, by playing Texas Hold'em, he decided to go all in and raise his investment into himself to 10% per year. He told me that he'd been doing this ever since. I asked him, how has investing 10% of your income back into yourself affected your income? He smiled and said, I passed a million dollars in personal income last year, and I still invest 10% of my income in myself every single year. I said, wow, it's a lot of money. How do you manage to spend that much money on personal development? He said, it's hard. I have to start spending money on myself in January in order to invest it all by the end of the year. I have an image coach, a sales coach, and a speaking coach. I have a large library in my home with every book, audio program, and video program on sales and personal success I can find. I attend conferences both nationally and internationally in my field. And my income keeps going up every year. There are three simple steps to become the best. Becoming one of the top people in your field requires discipline and application more than anything else. There are three simple steps that you can follow to become the very best in your field. 1. Read 60 minutes in your field each day. Turn off the television and the radio. Put aside the newspaper and read material about your field for one hour each day before you start working. Two. Listen to educational audio programs in your car. Start them and stop them as you listen, so that you can reflect on what you have just heard and think about how you can apply the ideas to your work. 3. Attend courses and seminars in your field regularly. Seek them out. Take online courses in the convenience of your own home. Courses that enable you to upgrade your skills and give you important ideas that you can use to be even more successful. The power of compound learning, like compound interest, is quite amazing. The more you learn, the more you can learn. The more you learn, the better your brain functions, and the smarter you get. Your memory and retention rate improves. The more you learn, the more relationships you find between something you learned at one time and something you learned at another time. Never stop learning and growing. The Achievement of Mastery how long does it take to achieve mastery in your field? According to the experts, the acquisition of mastery requires about 7 years or 10,000 hours of hard work. It takes 7 years to become a master salesperson. It takes 7 years to become a successful business person. It takes 7 years to become an excellent diesel mechanic. It takes 7 years to become an excellent brain surgeon. It seems to take 7 years or 10,000 hours of hard work to get to the top of any field. So, you might as well get started. The time is going to pass anyway. The starting point of your achieving mastery is for you to commit to excellence. I've never met a person who made a decision to get into the top 20% in their field who did not eventually achieve it. And I never met a person who got there having not made that decision. Making the decision and then following up with continuous, purposeful, disciplined action is essential. Talent is not enough. As I mentioned earlier, according to Jeffrey Colvin in his best-selling book, Talent is Overrated, 
Most people learn how to do their job in the first year, and then they never get any better. They just coast in their jobs. But the only direction you can coast is downhill. Many people will work away at a job for many years and never rise above the average. They will do their job from eight to five, but they never lift a finger to upgrade their skills. They will not invest any time learning their craft unless their company pays for the extra training and gives them the time off to take it. The average person does only an average job, and as a result, he earns an average income and worries about money all his life. He never realizes that often there is only a thin veil that separates the average person from the excellent person. Fact is that if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. No one stays in the same place for long. Two hours each day will get you to the top. It's been calculated that all you need to invest is about two extra hours per day to move from the average to the superior. Only two extra hours each day will move you from worrying about money all your life to being one of the highest-paid people in your field. People immediately ask. Where am I going to get an extra two hours each day? It's simple. Take a piece of paper and do the following simple calculation. Calculate the number of hours in a week. Seven days times twenty-four hours equals one hundred and sixty-eight hours. If you deduct forty hours for work and fifty-six hours for sleep, you have seventy-two hours left over. If you deduct three hours per day, twenty-one hours for getting ready for and traveling to and from work. That leaves you 51 hours of spare time to do with as you please. If you invest two hours per day back into yourself, 14 hours per week, you still have 37 hours left over. That's an average of more than five hours per day of free time. All you need to do is devote two hours each day to move you from average performance to superior performance at whatever you choose to do. Form the habit of continuous learning. The best news. Is that when you begin reading in personal or professional development literature, listening to audio programs in your car, taking additional courses, and upgrading your skills in the evenings and on the weekends, rather than watching television, you soon get into the habit of continuous learning. In no time at all, it will become automatic and easy for you to learn, grow, and upgrade your skills every day and every week. The average adult watches about five hours of television each day. For some people, it is seven or eight hours. They turn on the television first thing in the morning and watch it till they leave for work. They turn it back on as soon as they get home from work. They then watch television until eleven or twelve o'clock at night, going to bed without enough time to get a good night's sleep. They then get up in the morning, drink coffee, and watch television for as long as they can before they go off to work once more. You can be rich or poor. It's your decision. Your television set can make you rich or poor. If you watch it all the time, it will make you poor. Psychologists have shown that the more television you watch, the lower are your levels of energy and self-esteem. At an unconscious level, you don't like or respect yourself as much if you sit there hour after hour watching television. People who watch too much television also gain weight and become physically unfit from sitting around too much. Your television can also make you rich. But only if you turn it off. When you turn off your television, you free up time that you can then use to invest in becoming a better, smarter, or more competent person. When you leave your television off when you are with your family, you'll find yourself talking, sharing, communicating, and laughing more often. When you leave your television off for extended periods of time, you break the habit of watching television, and you'll hardly miss it at all. Your television can be an excellent servant, but it's a terrible master. The choice is yours. Increase your income 1,000 percent. There is a simple seven-step formula you can use in order to increase your productivity, performance, and output and income by 1,000 percent over the next 10 years. It works for everyone who tries it. It's simple. First, answer this question: Is it possible for you to increase your overall productivity, performance, and output by one tenth of one percent? Just one one thousandth in an entire working day. Your answer would probably be yes. If you were to manage your time a little better and work on more valuable tasks, you would quite easily increase your output by one one thousandth in a day.
Having done this for the first day, could you increase your output by one tenth of one percent the second day? And the answer, of course, is yes. Having increased your performance by one tenth of one percent on Monday and Tuesday, could you continue to do this for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday? And again, the answer is yes. One half of one percent per week. One tenth of one percent times five days per week equals one half of one percent per week. Is it possible for a normal, intelligent, hardworking individual to increase his or her output by one half of one percent or one two hundredth in a single week? Of course it is. Have you done this for the first week? Could you keep up the same pace of personal development the second week? Of course you could. Could you get one one thousandth of one percent better five days a week for an entire month? You could. This means that you would be one half of one percent better per week. Multiply times four, or two percent more productive in an entire month. There are thirteen four-week months in a year. Four times thirteen equals fifty-two. Having become two percent better in a month, could you repeat that in the second month, in the third month, fourth month, and so on? Of course you could. By working on yourself a little bit each day, learning new skills, getting better at your key tasks, setting priorities, and focusing on higher-value activities. You can become 26% more productive over the course of an entire year. Having achieved this goal for the first year, could you do it for the second year and then the third? Could you keep it up for 10 years? And the answer, of course, is yes. And the best news is that when you continue to work on yourself, it becomes easier and easier for you to get better and better as the weeks and months go by. By the law of accumulation, with the law of incremental improvement. By the end of 12 months, you would be 26% better. If you continue to improve at 26% per year, by the end of 10 years, with compounding, you could be 1,004% more productive. Your income would increase at the same rate. This formula works if you do. There are seven steps in the 1,000% formula. Step one: arise two hours before your first appointment or before you have to be at work. Invest the first hour in yourself by reading something educational, motivational, or spiritual. As Henry Ward Beecher once said, "The first hour is the rudder of the day." When you get up and invest the first hour in yourself, you set yourself up mentally to have an excellent day. You will be more positive, alert, creative, and productive all day long when you start your day by investing the first hour in yourself. If you read in your field one hour per day. That will translate into about one book per week. One book per week will translate into about 50 books per year. Since the average adult reads less than one nonfiction book per year, if you were to read 50 books in your field each year, do you think that would give you an edge in your profession? Do you think that it would move you ahead of virtually everyone else in your business? Of course it would. If you read 50 books per year for 10 years, this would be 500 books. That would help you to improve your productivity, performance, and income. At the very least, you would need a bigger house just to hold your books, and you'd be able to afford it. Reading one hour per day in your field will make you a national authority in three to five years. This alone can give you your thousand percent increase over the course of your career. Step two: rewrite your goals every day. Get a spiral notebook and rewrite your major goals in the present tense every morning before you start out, without looking back at what you wrote the previous day. This writing and rewriting is the process of programming instructions into the guidance mechanism of your mind. When you rewrite your ten goals each morning, you'll continually see and think of opportunities to achieve those goals all day long. You'll become more focused, channeled, directed. You'll be more purposeful and determined. And you will achieve your goals much faster than if they were merely wishes floating around in the back of your mind. Writing and rewriting your goals each day can give you your 1,000 percent increase in income over 10 years. Step three: Plan every day in advance. Make a list and set priorities on your work before you start off. Your ability to set priorities and to choose the most important thing that you could be doing at every moment. Is the key to organizing your life and doubling your productivity. We'll talk in detail about time management techniques in Chapter 
working on your top priorities can increase your income by 1,000% over 10 years. And it is probably impossible to achieve without it. Step 4. Discipline yourself to concentrate single-mindedly on one thing. Choose the most important thing that you can do each day. Then, start on it first thing and work on it until it's 100% complete. Your ability to focus and concentrate when you develop and hone it into a habit all by itself will enable you to double your productivity performance and output in the next month. And it will give you your 1000% increase over 10 years. Step 5. Listen to educational audio programs in your car. The average business person who drives spends 500 to 1000 hours per year behind the wheel of their car. When you turn your car into a university on wheels, a mobile classroom, you get the educational equivalent of one to two full-time university semesters as you drive around. Many people have gone from rags to riches by simply listening to educational audio programs in their cars as they drive from place to place. You could do the same. This alone could give you your 1,000% increase. Step number six. Ask two magic questions after every call or event. First, ask yourself, what did I do right? Then, ask yourself, what would I do differently? The first question, what did I do right, forces you to think through and recall all the correct things that you did in that last meeting, presentation, or event, even if it was not successful. Write them down. The second question, what would I do differently? forces you to think through all the different ways you could improve your performance in a similar situation. Write these ideas down as well. In both cases, by reviewing your performance by thinking about what you did right and what you would do differently, you program yourself to perform even better the next time. This is one of the fastest and most powerful exercises in personal growth and development I have ever discovered. This process dramatically speeds up the rate at which you move into the top 20%. Step 7. Treat every person you meet like a million dollar customer. Treat each person you meet and work with both at home and in the office as though he or she is the most important person in the world. When you treat people as if they are valuable and important, they will return the favor by treating you as if you are valuable and important as well. They will want to be associated with you, work for you, buy from you, and introduce you to their friends. You begin treating people like million dollar customers by starting at home with the members of your family. Remember, they are the most important people in your life. So when you start your day well first thing in the morning by making the members of your family feel important and telling them that you love them, you'll be more positive, relaxed, and happier for the rest of the day. Only 85% of your success will be determined by how much people like and respect you, especially in business and sales. Never miss an opportunity to treat people well. When you practice these seven steps each day for a month, you will see changes and improvements in your life, work, and income that will astonish you. After a month of regular practice, you'll have formed a new habit of continuous personal improvement that can carry you onward and upward for the rest of your life. Be the best. Lifelong personal development and the commitment to personal excellence requires tremendous dedication, discipline, and willpower. The greatest payoff is that every time you learn and apply something new, your brain releases endorphins, which make you feel happier and more excited about your future. Every time you learn and apply something new, you'll have a greater sense of personal power. Your self-esteem, self-respect, and personal pride will increase. You'll feel very much in control of your earned ability, which is one of the most important parts of your life.